Between gunpowder being invented in China, ending up in Europe, you know, it, Persia being in the middle of that, you know, where, and then we're talking about, you know, the, all these technologies coming across with matchlock, flintlock, percussion, you know, seeing their way back across that silk route um, and then being copied in Persia, as you're, as you're talking about, where, how does that dynamic take place with that technology transfer and where, where is that, where's the Persian twist? on that technology transfer and where, and where does that come across as, you know, where do things end up being uniquely Persian? Are there inventions or attempts with rockets, with cannon that, um, you know, happened between the, the, you know, China, you know, gunpowder coming along on the Silk Road that you don't see in Europe that are a uniquely Persian flair on that. Um, and then where does this stuff get copied from Europe that you're talking about, you know, that's so I mean, impeccably um, I mean, copied? If yeah. You, yeah. If you take a look, and uh, to me, I mean, if you come and look at the Persian uh, firearms, especially you will see it in my bo uh, book, the barrels, for example, the mm the pattern of different types of barrels, the pattern of steel, Persian smiths or gun makers try to continue a long tradition. You know, for example, if you take a look at crucible steel blades, right? There were many different, okay, there were different process because they were made of crucible steel. We know that you know, in the past, they, people thought that crucible steel is not suitable for making uh, barrels. I have never ever seen a Persian one, but uh, I've seen barrels made of crucible steel in India. So it exists. It's not that, because I remember many people were saying, oh, this is so dry, it doesn't fit, but it does actually. But the uh, Persians, I've never seen any Persian barrels made of that. But because making Pulade Gohardar, jeweled steel, like for um, blades, but also this type of Pulade Gohardar was also used for barrel, uh, for, excuse me, for welded steel for barrels. So the tradition, you can see it, the beauty and different types. I know that barrels made of welded steel were also very delicate and sophisticated, but trust me if I tell you that you have never ever seen barrels like that, you will not believe your eyes, what they produce, what type of, uh, beauty or uh, things they did and they had different names on it different um, things so barrels definitely but uh, regarding when the silk road okay in china then going there we know that ottomans were very very sophisticated as far as uh, artillery is concerned Ot ottomans were unbelievable right and you take a look at that what lots of te technology transfer was also to europe as far as guns as you know or, or, or cannons are concerned, or also because of confrontations with Ottomans. There is no doubt about that. Persians, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, during Timurid period, period at least, I mean, uh, the armies in there, they, as I said, they experimented with types of um, uh, firearms, right? Because uh, like, as well as the Chinese did, but then it was uh, not used during early Safavid period of Shah Ismail. Uh, my guess is, I'm not the only one who says that, is because of the type of warfare they used. He used lots of horses, horseback cavalry. They were very fast. They were very successful in defeating Uzbeks. They were very fast and, uh, in defeating many people, also going to, through the Afghanistan. They were so successful that when he confronted Ottomans, although they told him he's heavily outnumbered and they have guns, but he still believed he will succeed. succeed. Because he believed that he some, I, mean, I think it's both type of warfare as well, which they making formations of infantry, and then I know it exactly from Persian sources from Shah Ismail that they considered it too slow, right? Because they didn't consider they have rows. Some people load one shoots one one line shoots, then they go back. They they always thought they were going possibly through the same time, right? So they said mm -hmm. they would they would overrun them. And interestingly, in the first encounter with the Ottomans. In Chaldaran also, they broke some lines of the Ottomans, but again, they were outnumbered and they, they were no match for uh, artillery also for the, I mean, uh, the muskets of Ottomans, that's for sure. And that's why they were defeated. That's why then the Persian introduced more and more. I think it's more type of uh, warfare, right? And uh, which dictated it, right? Where Ottomans were, they had Sipahi, they had the cavalry, but they had also Janissaries, they had also infantry, they had a combination of different forces. 
where the Persians saw the necessity. And then that's why Shah Tahmas was successful again against Ottomans. That's why Shah um, Abbas, where they had all these formations, infantry, and uh, also were, were successful. So I, I'm afraid I cannot give you a clear answer why uh, Persians, uh, or in Persia at least in that area, uh, area they uh, did not make such things. I mean, I think it's dictating the type of warfare, but once they start to do that, they are successful. And what I'm really interest, interested in, minds, I'm more interested in weapon manufacturing, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm really interested in, and how they make it, what, what they use, what do they look like? And that's what I'm um, very, very interested in. Because you know that when we, when we analyze battles and battlefields, right? Um, it's very interesting, right? <laughs> the way people fight against it is is also what I do, but I'm more interested in material culture, analyzing of weapons. What is the materials used in it? What do they use? How it worked, and things like that. So, so here's so here and here here's a broader question, just to get on the fringe of some stuff. We have Damascus steel, right? The formation of Damascus steel of wrapping steel around, you know, an iron rod, right? And that's one technique of Damascus steel forming. Was that something that was used in, in Persian firearms manufacture, or is that something that is, you know, how do we? Yeah, let's talk about the materials. You know, we'll dive right into it. Yes, they they used yeah. it. Yes, they used you know, for example, different bars, right? Uh, and then they combine them. They call it also mar peach in a, in a twisting like a snake. They used it. That's what they use. Sometimes they use also different layers. They hammered it, but again, against the rod. And they were, you see that, you know, they have also names for it. They have also, I found the manuscript or manual where they call that the names. So they distinguished uh, the differences. Uh, it's always a color. As far as barrels are concerned, for blades is much more difficult, uh, complicated. But for barrels, this is the color which they use. This is the pattern what they use, right? And this is the lightness and darkness what they use. And combined on them, then they develop different names for each barrel. Mm -hmm. So my so my next question in terms of material technology, and also in the design, when when is the shift um, in Persia between smoothbore muskets into rifle barrels and i asked this and i asked this because it's it's very fascinating looking at you know the first anglo-afghan war where the misconception is you know well i mean oh the, you know these uh you know these primitive tajiks and pashtuns well it's like well guess what these primitive tajiks and pashtuns are sniping british officers from 200 to 300 meters away with rifled barrels you know, and are, and, and are very effective at doing so, you know, so it's like, when does, you know, when does that technology, that, 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 you know, that technology jump happening and, and was it so, I mean, I mean, for, I mean, rifled tech, rifled barrel technology was, a, was existed in many places in the world long before it became, the need for it became, re you know, readily apparent due to the mine ball and all, all sorts of other stuff. But was there, was there that, uh, when, how does that, how does that take place in Persia? Or did you have examples of, you know, we smooth bore muskets and use? Yeah. yeah. We have muskets already from Safavid period, which are the barrels, I mean, which are rifled. Already from Shah Abbas, we have it, which they're, they're, you see the rifled ones. Definitely. So very, very early on, right? Right. I mean, very early. Yeah, early on. Yeah. Yeah. Not all of them, but they they are rifled. Definitely, they're rifled. So when do we see? So when do we see? You know, mass production of that kind of stuff. And what is what is mass production? That's another important question. Is what is what is mass production of um, flintlocks and percussion were um, rifles and muskets in in, you know, Persia, I, in, the, in these eras? <laughs> yeah. These examples you see here, these examples you see here, none of them is mass produced. Mm. Okay? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know if you can. Yeah. See. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that. That's. Yeah. That's. This. This is a form of art. Right. <laughs> You know. <laughs> you know, these are yeah. royal collection, and I, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, all the nastalik on the side. Wow, it's beautiful. 
these are pieces of art. You find here yeah. 112, including cannons on pieces of art. I mean, I mean, the way they cast cannons. I mean, it, you know, no longer is like, you know, I originally come from Japanese uh, blade, you know, and then also then to Persian blades. And these are paintings, right? Of course, they're formidable weapons. I know that. I mean, they're the best cutters, mm. but they're paintings, right? The question of these type of things, which you have, I mean, mass produced and these type of things. I mean, of course, they were all uh, uh, used by high ranking generals, officers, or royal court members. No doubt about that. This was an ordinary soldier could, I mean, come on. I mean, we know that, right? These are in the king's mm. collection, and that's for sure, right? But, yeah, um, yeah. You know, that's for sure. But, you know, they had, you know, even if you go to like some tribes in Iran today, like in Bakhtiari tribe, or if you go to Sistan and Maluchistan, you still find some of them have these old guns, which they keep it. These are like, like cheaply produced. But interestingly, I mean, we have, we have, for example, also, I think it's in my book or I have no, it's not in this book, but I wrote an article for a Russian scientific magazine in English about uh, an, another manuscript where they talk about uh, firearms manufacture and then in big numbers, which was in the southern Iran. So they used it. I mean, if what is then mass produced? That's the question. I mean, it's a European understanding of mass produced. You know what I mean? So it's, um, it's nothing like that. Maybe some parts of it were like, like the Japanese, um, look at the Japanese matchlock guns, right? I mean, they're not mass produced. We know that they produce lots of them but still, they were not the way we understand in the West what mass production is all about, right? But the, really, I, I tell you, I mean, it's not also from Europeans who traveled to Iran back then, um, all praise, all praise the accuracy and also the high quality of Persian firearms. That for, I can tell you that. That's for sure. So what... So what was, so can you talk about some more of the roles of, because we have these exquisite pieces in the Royal Collection, um, and, you know, were the roles of firearms, because you have that, that, that long standing tradition of Persian cavalry, right? And, you know, this sort of maybe reluctance to use firearms in certain ways due to this, due to the, um, due to the, the steadfastness of the cavalry. Um, so what, so where did firearms show up? You know, we, uh, maybe for the hunting parties, I assume, or as, you know, gift commemorative stuff for the Royal families. Um, but then where else do they show up elsewhere and I mean, how do they show up? As I, as these, I mentioned that, um, after the defeat of Chaldaran, they already understood the new warfare. You cannot win it with cavalry only and without firearms. Mm -hmm. They already, you know, I mean, if you look at also during Shah Abbas, definitely he had this Ghazal Bash, as they called it, this cavalry, he tried to reduce them. He had more forces also coming from Caucasia, he integrated into his uh, army, um, infantry, uh, and also musket men and musketeers, and many of them, he introduced them. And then that's, that's why he was successful. So already in Shah Abbas era, we, we find that the integration of cannons, muskets, and also infantry. So it, or it's not only that it was for hunting parties there. They, they realized that they cannot rely on this old way or old fashioned way of fighting because the Chaldaran battle was a very big lesson for them. And as I mentioned, they were successful. If you come to Nader Shah period, I mean, you see lots of pictures. You know, for example, let's look at this. This is from is Jahangir Shah Naderi. This book is praised. Yeah. This book is praised uh, for its accuracy, the way they depict them, right? All the guns and all this. You see that they, now the Shah was very, now the Shah of Shah, successful in his campaign, also against Ottomans and the others. So you see, it's not only they have infantry, they have cannons, they have muskets, musketeers, and they have all these things which integrated in there. As I said to, to you, you know, I have. Um, the thing is already, you know, I translated three of these manuals. They are more on technical part, but they also I have uh, many more, as I mentioned, at 125. And they are also on formation, integration, how to deploy infantry in warfare, how to deploy cavalry. But um, yeah, I, <laughs> I keep working around the clock, but basically, it's, so I, mean, I don't only do research on uh, firearms, I also do research, of course, on swords 
and other types of weapons. But, um, and, and translating and interpreting these things are not easy. Let me just give you one example. Yes, please, uh, yeah. In this book, um, you know, there is a translation of, you know, you can compare it to Congreve rockets, like General and Colonel Congreve, he lost the battle. I mean, British lost the battle in Tyre of Mysore, and then they came back and he comes back and makes all these containers of rockets. He makes them, or I mean, he said we need to make them iron containers so they're more, uh, no, it's not only paper, so it's going to have more explosive power. But then this Tabrizi gets a hold of this and he translates it back then in Persian, adds lots of materials to it and writes to the king and he ha is making rockets this way and that way, much better than the British, right? And he then writes in the beginning of the book that he believes that the British were hiding the facts from Persians because they wrote in English in a way which doesn't make sense. I don't know, <laughs> he's saying that way, okay. But then the whole time when he writes, he talks about Feshang, right? When I had this you know, in a museum, when I had these copies of this with picture, it took pictures of it. So it's like hundred pages, I don't know. And um, I realized, I asked them, okay, how many manus manuals do they have on firearms? They have so many, right? But then I, I said, okay, what is it about? They told me it's about bullets. I say, about what? About bullets, because Feshang in Persian, today's Persian in Iran, Farsi means bullet. I said, what? Yeah. So I started to read. Then I realized they're talking about rockets. But rockets in today Persian is mushak, it's not Feshang, right? So if you're a native speaker of uh, Persian, you think, as the librarians thought, this manual is about bullets, not about rockets, but actually it's Feshang back then was used to refer to rockets, not to bullets, right? Mm -hmm. Which we have a semantic shift in Persian not long time ago. It's from, we we're talking about the Qajar period, right? So, you know, this is one of the challenges you have. Then other challenges you have in Persian, lots of technical terms, you know, you need to go and say, okay, what do they mean here and there? You need to make comparison, Victorian era publications in English, make a comparison, cross-referencing, okay, what do they mean here and there? So it's very challenging and at the same time, very interesting when they talk. My research is not uh, finished because as I mentioned it to you, I have uh, lots of manuals and I need to translate them to give you clear answers because uh, these are written in Persian by Persians, by people there, and which will reveal lots of information to us outsiders. I mean, today word, today's word. I mean. And this is what makes it very, very interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and you know, so concurrently, uh, uh, that's so fascinating about the translation and um, the issues and the problems with that. At the same time, um, so we're looking at um, Martini Henry rifles produced in Kabul at the Kabul arsenal. And there's, there's the same issue with the translation. And it, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of issues with that. I mean, for instance, there's certain markings on the uh, Kabul Arsenal rifles that actually use the Abjad alphabet in, yes. in digits. And for the longest time, you know, there's this word on there that was spelled in, uh, in Dari. It was 97531. And then right above it, there was the Abjad of it. Um, and it was... <laughs> And it was so, and it was it was so funny because it's like for the longest time it's like what like if you don't know what the abjad alphabet is you're totally lost in the sauce about it. But once you know, then it sort of makes sense. And this is only a hundred years ago that these rifles were produced, and they used these word these um these word these words there, and the word the word exactly um, was jahaz for ready, right? But in Dari, it was an Arabic word for jahaz, but it was an Arabic word that was spelled using a Dari script. So the funny part about it was that Afghans today had no idea what it was because it was an Arabic word that is not, new, that is not really in use anymore. But then Arabs don't know what it is because it's an Arabic word that using a Dari script. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's the same, it's actually a similar kind of thing what you're talking about with that shift 
right? And that was the and that was the annoying part about trying to figure out what that word was, because it was because you know neither side knew what it was, even though you know they're native speakers of it, and it was an Arabic word spelled in Dari, but it was you know so that that I, I can I you're, you're talking about the shift between ammunition and rockets, and it's like wow yeah <laughs> I've crossed that bridge with the Kabul arsenal stuff, and that's like what you know at the end of the day um but that is so fascinating about about the translation problem the translation hurdles you have to go over there i have a manual in persian i think it's like 85 pages from the period of qajar is about exactly this little rifle you're talking about it's about its production its marking and so in persian about the about the Kabul arsenal, about no, the uh, Kabul arsenal, arsenal but about the rifle you talk about. Maybe the it's martini, about Kabul. the martini Henry. Yeah. Ah. I don't know. Maybe be... it's about Kabul arsenal. Maybe I don't know. I haven't. I haven't. I was not very interested in that because I have it. And because I, I will translate all these things one day. The thing is, you know, I was talking to Beat, and I have a big research team. You know, in Razmafsar organization, we have lots of researchers. But the thing mm -hmm. is. Uh, you have so many research projects. And actually, to be honest, Miles, what we need is, you know, I teach as a, uh, I work as a lecturer and professor at two universities, but in a different field. But what we need is to make the whole thing a university subject and to do research on the whole thing. I have hundreds of manuals, hundreds. And this is original research and I can, we can set up teams and even, people don't need to speak Persian because we have enough people who are good at Persian, but it's just combining Persian and also knowledge of weapons. Like you guys, for example, having small arms and also others having archery, whatever, and make a huge, but you know, all these things need finance. All, the, all these things need, you know, what, what it takes, you know, you need financing, you need, you know, a big research team, you need, uh, you know, you need a center, you need, and you know, and then, you know, if, if, if people are interested, you know, I mean, in this old historical research is not, you know, if you do business administration, everyone is interested in. It's clear. It's law, business yeah. administration. It's clear, right? Because you, then you, yeah. it's, you find a career. You can, you know, make money for your family. I'm not criticizing it. That's why I also teach. This is not a big deal. But these type of things, what a good thing about them is, Miles, these are original research which I have. And this makes a huge difference, not for the hundreds times uh, there was a European traveler who at the 18th century, he was a British guy traveling to the region and he saw the Afghans. Miles, let me just ask you something. And because you know this person who traveled to the region, what do I expect from a guy back then who had never been to the region before in 18th century to have an open-minded, to have an open mind to report something which is re reliable, 18th century guy, you understand what I mean? What do I expect from such a guy? These guys, you know, look at English reports, the way they talk about Spanish, right? Look at the, the way <laughs> the French yeah. talk about British back then. They all, you know, talk down back then. It's not that today's world, right? That people are, I mean, not that everyone is open-minded, but today people travel, we have different types of mentality. But back then, my God, 18th century, what do I expect of these European travelers there, right? You, you see what I mean? So that's, I'm not saying it's bad, um, Miles, for research. They, we should also take them into consideration. But more important, in my opinion, is to find out these manuals, right? And try to find out what do they report because then we can cross-reference. Okay, this is this, this is this. And uh, I have, as I said, you mentioned it before, I have lots of these things. Also, I'm sure because in Persian, I don't know, maybe it's about uh, Kabul arsenal. I don't know, I have to check it. I have to check and find out. Mm -hmm. I never read it, to be honest with you. I know this is about that, right? I know that. Oh, yeah. wow, that's... Uh... Uh, no, no, it's it's kind of it's happened recently. Uh, last year, I was in Kabul with one of my very very good friends, and it was we were talking about um, the uh, well, the first single Afghan war, and, and you know the the, the doctor, Doctor Warbreck, I forget his name, but you know he was the only survivor of the of the of the British army to get to uh, Jalalabad, right? And um, 
I was, we were talking about it and I was like, yeah, when that guy like got away and my friend was like, wait, what you mean he got away? And I was like, well, he, there was, we have accounts in the, the British history of, you know, he, there's that, that's, uh, there's, um, one village, um, in near, not near Kunar, but where it's like, you know, there's a little fight and there's a fight and he was the last part of the British army and all the officers were killed and he was able to get away. And my friend was like, wait, wait, that narrative is not what we, it's not what we have in our narrative. We let him get away. Like we let him go back. And it's like, whoa, these two narratives are diametrically opposite to each other. The British one is saying like, he fought away on his own two feet. The Afghan narrative is saying like, no, we let you go to let everyone else know. So it's like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> well, what's the, well, what's the indigenous narrative saying? What's the, what's the outside narrative saying? And how do those come together? And, you know, so. it's a little bit of both, you know, we don't actually know with that, but we have to see, okay. Cause we, we'll never, we'll never, you know, the British and the Afghans, unless they ever get together and say, our narrative says a hundred percent opposite of what your narrative says, you know, we'll never be able to even see a prism of what might've been the case. Yeah, so. that's, you know, that's the reason, you know, to be honest, Miles, I'm more interested in material culture and weapons to analyze than to get into these discussions because I'm not interested in nationalism. You understand what I mean, Miles? You know, <laughs> you, know God, I, I, you understand, Miles, what I mean. You know, when we talk about blades, when we talk about uh, mechanisms, fire mechanisms, and uh, all these things, or, you know, gold inlaying on barrels and all these things, not that you misunderstand me. We need also to understand about the battles because we need to understand why and how they made them and why they used it and how they used it. I'm not saying it's not important, but all, you know, there are some people, for example, as you might know, they talk about battle formations and fighting and these things, but they have never even handled a sword, right? But they talk about fighting in battle formations and you know what I mean? So if you need both sides and then again, both disciplines, right? both disciplines, material culture, weapon analysis, and also formations, military tactics, and so both. But then again, as you mentioned it, from both sides, local and indigenous, and also people from the other side. The only this way we can have an understanding, or at least try to have an understanding about the past, right? And military confrontations, right? And there's definitely, I mean, and I, that's the sort of the allure to me too about the material side of it it's like you know the material side of it has no nationalist pedigree it has no nationalist leaning i mean it's steel and wood or plastic and polymer it doesn't matter it's like you know the firearm or the sword doesn't have a nationalist leaning either way <laughs> so it's it's in of itself it's an objective historical um fact right? It's, you know, it's, you know, a book is, you know, a book can be pro or con or not objective or, you know, this way or that way, but an object can't be objective. It's, and an object by definition is objective. It's an object, right? It's however you, you look at it, but with material technology, if you look at it from that aspect is, okay, well, we can examine the attributes and the capabilities and the effectiveness and the limitations. And okay, now we're, now we're playing with fire here, you know, instead of saying, well, that kind of thing. Things, but I'm sure, as I said, these are not the only thing. I have 125, but there are many more. I, I mean, I'm yeah. sure I will find information on them. Um, yeah. uh, so here's, so here's, so here's a question. Can you? So what are some of the terms? Um, maybe terms of antiquity. You know, Farsi terms that are you that you see that are you know um, that that are very prevalent or important to re to note for researchers, for people looking into um, Persian firearms in terms uh, of- Remember um, I you this one? Mm -hmm. This one is my lexicon. Ah, yes. This okay. has 5,700 entries. Mm -hmm. And these are not swords as well, manufacturing of uh, crucible steel and all these things. And among them, there are also firearms terminology in it. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. So, so yeah. here's so you mentioned. So I like the fact that yeah, the lexicon there with the symbols. You mentioned the lion earlier, talking about the lion. What was the significance there? Uh, did, were you talking about the, the, does the lion does the symbol of a lion appear? Um, you know, on earlier 
Persian rifles and muskets because it definitely appears on, you know, rifles like the Berno and the Kota and stuff like that. And then, you know, the G3 in, you know, prior to the Islamic Republic. Um, but where does the lion fit, in, fit into this with, as a symbol? I mean, I have, I have different articles written on the symbol of lion and the sun on arms and armor. Also, is in my first book, Persian, um, no, arms and armor from Iran. The whole chapter is about that. The lion. I mean, there are different opinions about that, but lion actually is a symbol of Persian kingdom. You see it already in Achaemenid period. If you go to Persepolis, right, or as we call it, Takht Jamshid, or um, if you go there, you see that there is a bull and there is a lion, or a lion is fighting a bull, right? And uh, this bull is very strong, and then the lion is um, subjugating the bull. And then, then again, so this was a kingly uh, or royal symbol. But then there are also different opinions about that. What does this lion mean? Is it like that it is uh, killing the bull? But some, uh, some researchers say actually it's not. It, it says, for example, that the lion stands for the spring when the Nowruz comes and the bull is a symbol of the moon and the lion is the symbol of the sun. So the sun is conquering the moon and then this coming, I mean, the spring is coming, right? So, and then at the same time, uh, lion, uh, some people say that lion back then in a community period, also later on, is a symbol of king of kings, right? That's Shah and Shah that you are. Shah and Shah, yeah. Right? That you are yeah. the king of the kings. And then uh, this is the, I mean, lion played through the whole Iranian history, a very, very important role, as you know that. And you see that even in the, if you come later after, in, uh, from ancient period, uh, Iran, from Sassanid and later, you see that this symbol was depicted again and again, again and again. And I, I, I explain it in detail. You see it on um, coins, you see it then on uh, 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 flags, on banners, you see it on arms and armor. You see it then later on, I mean, during Safavid period, Timurid Safavid, or also Zand period, on daggers, on swords. But you see all of a sudden, then the lion is still there, but then you don't have a bull, then you have another animal, smaller animal, but the lion is still subjugating it. But mm. So there are different things, and the lion is always fighting and subjugating all animals. So it's a symbol. I mean, lion is, has been a symbol of a, per, a Persian character, actually. It's very important. So, yeah. yeah, so... so... So, but my, qu my question is, you know, the, the symbol is important, the national symbol, the historical, you know, back to, you know, pre-Islamic times, etc. cetera. Um, so we got that, but what, why the connection to small arm? Well, why the connection to weapons, to arms and armor? And even up until, you know, the, the, this lion still appears on the G3 semi-automatic rifle in the, into the 1970s, right? You know, Whereas if we look at, you know, if we look at, I think we look at the UK, we look at Britain, for example, I think the lion, um, a lion played a role there as well in terms of royalty and kings and queens and stuff. But, but the British weren't stamping the lion on, you know, all their, Lien fields into the Second World War, whereas Iran was, you, you know. So what what's what's the connection with that, with with that with that piece? I mean, lion is you know, is, and some of them. I'm just trying to find out one, some of these battles. I mean, I cannot find it so fast, but some of mm. them have a Persian poem saying, "My gun, my barrel will roar like a lion, and then mm. you will understand why." Right. Or another one oh. says as well, my barrel will roar and cry and scream like a dragon. Because some of them have a dragon sign. You will see beautiful yeah. dragons. And some of them, most of them have lions. So this transfer of power of lion and dragon, dragon is the same thing, um, is you can find them on many barrels. Right. But uh, no, dragon aside, putting dragon aside, because um, you see it also on swords, some of them dragons or lions as well. The symbol of lion is very important. And then they say people, for example, when the lion is there, I mean, I did, did chapters are wrote on that. And then when there is a sun, when the sun comes, it's a celestial figure, lion and the sun together, 
give you absolute power to the kingdom and the, to the to warriors who fight for the kingdom. So it's a very important thing, sun, the sun and the lion, right? And uh, important is because sun and the lion, they come together in Persian mythology and also in Persian history. Because please uh, remember this, um, Nowruz, Persian New Year, Nowruz is the beginning of spring when days uh, get long. For Persian, I mean, um, way of thinking, the year starts when uh, everything uh, starts to blossom, right? When the sun starts to rise and sun and the line are together, right? I'm not saying in some other cultures, it's just not like that. Some other cultures, the moon is important, right? Darkness is important. I'm not, I'm not associating bad things with darkness. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm just talking about that in Persian uh, way of thinking, lion and the sun were something which were important and gave you power. In other cultures, they're different. I'm not saying this one is good or this one is bad, not at all. I'm just saying this is a different concept. So because of that, based on cultural uh, understanding of lion and the sun, this was, that's why they depicted it. But you see that again on arms and armor, you see it on armor, you see it on swords, you see it in many, on axes and this line all the time. Not all the time, but many, on many pieces, you see that already. Mm, interesting, yeah. There is, huh, there's, I'm trying to think, there's, well, there, there's a year, that makes that makes me rethink. There's, um, there's a year, there's a European, I think I think it's I think it's the British Proof House. Well, the the London Proof House um, has, has this recognition of having one of the longest markings because that they they've been marking they've been using one of the same symbols since the 1600s, and they have this distinction of using one of the longest markings. And I'm starting to rethink that, and I'm like, well, how, how about we look at some of this Persian stuff? You know, they've been marking stuff with lions and suns since. You know, long before the long before firearms and gunpowder were invented, up until you know the G three semi automatic rifle in the nineteen seventies. That's kind of it's kind of interesting to put it that way. Um, it's it's so it's in this. I kind of I'd, I'd like to just mention this real quick. But among American collectors of the Bernal rifle, of the Bernal Mausers in the U S., there's actually this distinction between. Um, the Czech Bernos and then the Iranian Bernos yes. by looking at the lion and they call one lion the brave lion and one lion the crying lion because the crying lion the the way the way the metal has been engraved well the metal, way the metal has been stamped um, on the receiver it looks like the lion's eyes have a tear but the ones um, the earlier ones they they're very they're like the eyes are like slits so it looks you know like a brave lion and it's just a funny distinction it's just like what american collectors like oh is it a crying lion or is it a brave lion it's like oh it's crying so it's post world war 2 oh it's brave so it's pre world war 2 <laughs> <laughs> interesting okay yeah yeah this weird caveat of the lion but that goes into there huh um so I think we we've been talking for a while now, and I've well, I have really I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, and I think you're um you're you're probably about to get to sleep on your end, and it's it's about to become daybreak here um here in China, um so I, I would really just like to thank you so much, sir, for for coming on no, board and you know talking I mean, about this. If you if you if you you know later on want to have a more specific discussion regarding firearms, and if you Maybe one day get hold of this Persian fire and still, and maybe if you find information, we can then talk about it because you know these are very technical, and without sh uh, you know knowing and showing, uh, you know, talking about that, it's very and I'm a bit hesitant sometimes, you know, to just just talk from top of my head because I need to show something, you know, so something mm -hmm. is there so we can take a, we can take a look at it and see that, and um, yeah. No, I agree, hundred percent. No, right after this, I'm gonna. No, I'm ordering. No, I'm ordering your book. I'm gonna order the. I want to order the lexicon as well. Um, and when they get, when when they get to the U.S., um, I'm gonna be away from the U.S. until at least until the summer. So I'm gonna have to have someone show me the book on Skype. And I'm like, no, oh, stop the page. Take a take a better picture of that. I'm gonna have to send it, you know, over Facebook and see and get get a better interpretation of this and figure out something like that. But no, I, I, absolutely, um, I def I definitely want to do that for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
Cool. Well, uh, I think you, sir, I think, I think we can call it a wrap, I guess. Um, sure. And I think, thank you so much. And despite all the connection issues and the scheduling and grading and stuff like that, um, this has been, this has been such, such a pleasure, such, such a, such, such a, you know, as spont such a such about a spont spontaneity in talking about this stuff. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a nice day then. Yes, you too as well, sir. Bye. -bye. Yeah.